The Swiss Family Robinson. Chapter 2. Part 2. My son inquired to what species of the monkey tribe I thought his protege belonged, which led to a good deal of talk on the subject, and conversation beguiling the way, we found ourselves ere long on the rocky margin of the stream, and close to the rest of our party. Juno was the first to be aware of our approach, and gave notice of it by loud barking, to which Turk replied with such hearty good will that his little rider, terrified at the noise his steed was making, slipped from under the cord and fled to his refuge on Fritz's shoulder, where he regained his composure and settled himself comfortably. Turk, who by this time knew where he was, finding himself free, dashed forward to rejoin his friends and announce our coming. One after another our dear ones came running to the opposite bank, testifying in various ways their delight at our return, and hastening up on their side of the river, as we on ours, to the ford at which we had crossed in the morning. We were quickly on the other side, and, full of joy and affection, our happy party was once more united. The boys, suddenly perceiving the little animal which was clinging close to their brother, in alarm at the tumult of voices, shouted in ecstasy, "'A monkey! a monkey! Oh, how splendid! Where did Fritz find him? What may we give him to eat? Oh, what a bundle of sticks! Look at those curious great nuts father has got!' We could neither check this confused torrent of questions, nor get in a word in answer to them. At length, when the excitement subsided a little, I was able to say a few words with a chance of being listened to. I am truly thankful to see you all safe and well, and, thank God, our expedition has been very satisfactory, except that we have entirely failed to discover any trace of our shipmates. If it be the will of God, said my wife, to leave us alone on this solitary place, let us be content, and rejoice that we are all together in safety. Now we want to hear all your adventures, and let us relieve you of your burdens, added she, taking my game-bag. Jack shouldered my gun, Ernest took the coconuts, and little Franz carried the gourds. Fritz distributed the sugar-canes amongst his brothers, and, handing Ernest his gun, replaced the monkey on Turk's back. Ernest soon found the burden with which Fritz had laden him too heavy for his taste. His mother, perceiving this, offered to relieve him of part of the load. He gave up willingly the coconuts, but no sooner had he done so than his elder brother exclaimed, "'Hullo, Ernest! You surely do not know what you are parting with. Did you really intend to hand over those good coconuts without so much as tasting them?' "'What, ho, are they really coconuts?' cried Ernest. "'Do let me take them again, mother. Do let me look at them.' "'No, thank you,' replied my wife with a smile. "'I have no wish to see you again overburdened.' "'Oh, but I have only to throw away these sticks.' which are of no use, and then I can easily carry them. "'Worse and worse,' said Fritz. "'I have a particular regard for those heavy, useless sticks. Did you ever hear of sugar-canes?' The words were scarcely out of his mouth when Ernest began to suck vigorously at the end of the cane, with no better result, however, than Fritz had obtained as we were on the march. "'Here,' said Fritz, "'let me show you the trick of it.' and he speedily set all the youngsters to work extracting the luscious juice. My wife, as a prudent housekeeper, was no less delighted than the children with this discovery. The sight of the dishes also pleased her greatly, for she longed to see us eat once more like civilized beings. We went into the kitchen, and there found preparations for a truly sumptuous meal. Two forked sticks were planted in the ground on either side of the fire. On these rested a rod from which hung several tempting-looking fish. Opposite them hung a goose from a similar contrivance, slowly roasting, while the gravy dropped into a large shell placed beneath it. In the centre sat the great pot, from which issued the smell of a most delicious soup. To crown this splendid array stood an open hogshead full of Dutch cheeses. All this was very pleasant to two hungry travellers, but I was about to beg my wife to spare the poultry, until our stock should have increased, when she, perceiving my thought, quickly relieved my anxiety. "'This is not one of our geese,' she said, "'but a wild bird Ernest killed.' "'Yes,' said Ernest, 
"'It is a penguin, I think. "'It let me get quite close, "'so that I knocked it on the head with a stick. "'Here are its head and feet, "'which I preserved to show you. "'The bill is, you see, narrow and curved downward, "'and the feet are webbed. "'It had funny little bits of useless wings, "'and its eyes looked so solemnly and sedately at me "'that I was almost ashamed to kill it. "'Do you not think it must have been a penguin?' "'I have little doubt on the matter, my boy, "'and I was about to make a few remarks on the habits of this bird "'when my wife interrupted me and begged us to come to dinner "'and continue our natural history conversation at some future time. "'We then sat down before the appetizing meal prepared for us, "'our gourds coming for the first time into use, "'and having done it full justice, "'produced the coconuts by way of dessert.' "'Here is better food for your little friend,' said I to Fritz, who had been vainly endeavouring to persuade the monkey to taste dainty morsels of the food we had been eating. "'The poor little animal has been accustomed to nothing but its mother's milk. Fetch me a saw, one of you.' I then, after extracting the milk of the nuts from their natural holes, carefully cut the shells in half, thus providing several more useful basins. The monkey was perfectly satisfied with the milk, and eagerly sucked the corner of a handkerchief dipped in it. Fritz now suddenly recollected his delicious wine, and, producing his flask, begged his mother to taste it. "'Try it first yourself,' said I. Fritz did so, and I instantly saw by his countenance that the liquor had passed through the first stage of fermentation, and had become vinegar. "'Never mind, my boy,' said my prudent wife, when she learned the cause of his wry faces. "'We have wine already, but no vinegar. I am really pleased at the transformation.' The sun was now rapidly sinking behind the horizon, and the poultry, retiring for the night, warned us that we must follow their example. Having offered up our prayers, we lay down on our beds. The monkey crouched down between Jack and Fritz, and we were all soon fast asleep.' We did not, however, long enjoy this repose. A loud barking from our dogs, who were on guard outside the tent, awakened us, and the fluttering and cackling of our poultry warned us that a foe was approaching. Fritz and I sprang up, and, seizing our guns, rushed out. There we found a desperate combat going on. Our gallant dogs, surrounded by a dozen or more large jackals, were fighting bravely. Four of their opponents lay dead, but the others were in no way deterred by the fate of their comrades. Fritz and I, however, sent bullets through the heads of a couple more, and the rest galloped off. Turk and Juno did not intend that they should escape so cheaply, and, pursuing them, they caught, killed, and devoured another of the animals, regardless of their near relationship. Fritz wished to save one of the jackals that he might be able to show it to his brothers in the morning, Dragging, therefore, the one that he had shot near the tent, he concealed it, and we once more returned to our beds. Soundly and peacefully we slept until cock-crow next morning, when my wife and I awoke, and began to discuss the business of the day. "'It seems absolutely necessary, my dear wife,' I began, "'to return at once to the wreck while it is yet calm, that we may save the poor animals left there, and bring on shore many articles of infinite value to us, which, if we do not now recover, we may finally lose entirely. On the other hand, I feel that there is an immense deal to be done on shore, and that I ought not to leave you in such an insecure shelter as this tent. "'Return to the wreck by all means,' replied my wife cheerfully. "'Patience, order, and perseverance will help us through all our work, and I agree with you that a visit to the wreck is without doubt our first duty. Come, let us wake the children, and set to work without delay. They were soon roused, and Fritz, overcoming his drowsiness before the others, ran out for his jackal. It was cold and stiff from the night air, and he placed it on its legs before the tent, in a most lifelike attitude, and stood by to watch the effect upon the family. The dogs were the first to perceive their enemy, and, growling, seemed inclined to dispose of the animal as they had disposed of its brethren in the night, but Fritz called them off. The noise the dogs made, however, had the effect of bringing out the younger children, and many were the exclamations they made at the sight of the strange animal. 
"'A yellow dog!' cried Franz. "'A wolf!' exclaimed Jack. "'It is a striped fox,' said Ernest. Hullo, said Fritz, "'the greatest men may make mistakes. "'Our professor does not know a jackal when he sees one.' "'But really,' continued Ernest, examining the animal, "'I think it is a fox.' "'Very well, very well,' retorted Fritz. "'No doubt you know better than your father. "'He thinks it is a jackal.' "'Come, boys,' said I, "'no more of this quarrelling. "'You are none of you very far wrong, "'for the jackal partakes of the nature of all three, "'dog, wolf, and fox.' "'The monkey had come out on Jack's shoulder, "'but no sooner did it catch sight of the jackal "'than it fled precipitately back into the tent "'and hid itself in a heap of moss.' until nothing was visible but the tip of its little nose. Jack soothed and comforted the frightened little animal, and I then summoned them all to prayers, soon after which we began our breakfast. So severely had we dealt with our supper the previous night, that we had little to eat but the biscuits, which were so dry and hard that, hungry as we were, we could not swallow much. Fritz and I took some cheese to help them down, while my wife and younger sons soaked theirs in water. Ernest roamed down to the shore, and looked about for shellfish. Presently he returned with a few whelks. "'Ah,' said he, "'if we had but some butter!' "'My boy,' I replied, "'your perpetual if-if quite annoys me. Why do you not sit down and eat cheese like the rest of us?' "'Not while I can get butter,' he said. "'See here, father,' and he pointed to a large cask. "'That barrel contains butter of some sort or another, "'for it is oozing out at the end.' "'Really, Ernest,' I said, "'we are indebted to you. "'I will open the cask.' "'So saying, I took a knife and carefully cut a small hole "'so that I could extract the butter "'without exposing the mass of it "'to the effects of the air and heat.' Filling a coconut shell, we once more sat down, and, toasting our biscuits before the fire, spread them with the good Dutch butter. We found this vastly better than the dry biscuits, and while we were thus employed, I noticed that the two dogs were lying unusually quiet by my side. I at first attributed this drowsiness to their large meal during the night, but I soon discovered that it arose from a different cause— the faithful animals had not escaped unhurt from their late combat, but had received several deep and painful wounds, especially about the neck. The dogs began to lick each other on places which they could not reach with their own tongues, and my wife carefully dressed the wounds with butter, from which she had extracted the salt by washing. A sudden thought now struck Ernest, and he wisely remarked that if we were to make spiked collars for the dogs, they would in future escape such dangerous wounds. "'Oh, yes!' exclaimed Jack, "'and I will make them. May I not, father?' "'Try, by all means, my little fellow,' said I, "'and persuade your mother to assist you. "'And now, Fritz,' I continued, "'we must be starting, for you and I are to make a trip to the wreck.' I begged the party who were to remain on shore to keep together as much as possible, and having arranged a set of signals with my wife, that we might exchange communications, asked a blessing on our enterprise. I erected a signal post, and, while Fritz was making preparations for our departure, hoisted a strip of sailcloth as a flag. This flag was to remain hoisted so long as all was well on shore, but should our return be desired, three shots were to be fired, and the flag lowered. All was now ready, and, warning my wife that we might find it necessary to remain all night on the vessel, we tenderly bade adieu, and embarked. Except our guns and ammunition we were taking nothing, that we might leave as much space as possible for the stowage of a large cargo. Fritz, however, had resolved to bring his little monkey, that he might obtain milk for it as soon as possible. We had not got far from the shore, when I perceived that a current from the river set in directly for the vessel, and though my nautical knowledge was not great, I succeeded in steering the boat into the favourable stream, which carried us nearly three-fourths of our passage, with little or no trouble to ourselves. Then, by dint of hard pulling, we accomplished the whole distance, 
and, entering through the breach, gladly made fast our boat and stepped on board. Our first care was to see the animals, who greeted us with joy, lowing, bellowing, and bleating as we approached. Not that the poor beasts were hungry, for they were all still well supplied with food, but they were apparently pleased by the mere sight of human beings. Fritz then placed his monkey by one of the goats, and the little animal immediately sucked the milk with evident relish, chattering and grinning all the while. The monkey provided for, we refreshed ourselves with some wine and biscuits. Now, said I, we have plenty to do. Where shall we begin? Let us fix a mast and sail to our boat, answered Fritz for the current which brought us out will not take us back, whereas the fresh breeze we met would help us immensely, had we but a sail. Capital thought, I replied, let us set to work at once. I chose a stout spar to serve as a mast, and having made a hole in a plank nailed across one of the tubs, we, with the help of a rope and a couple of blocks, stepped it and secured it with stays. We then discovered a lug-sail, which had belonged to one of the ship's boats. This we hoisted, and our craft was ready to sail. Fritz begged me to decorate the masthead with a red streamer, to give our vessel a more finished appearance. Smiling at this childish but natural vanity, I complied with his request. I then contrived a rudder, that I might be able to steer the boat, for though I knew that an oar would serve the purpose, it was cumbrous and inconvenient. While I was thus employed, Fritz examined the shore with his glass, and soon announced that the flag was flying, and all was well. So much time had now slipped away that we found we could not return that night, as I had wished. We signalled our intention of remaining on board, and then spent the rest of our time in taking out the stones we had placed in the boat for ballast, and stowed in their place heavy articles of value to us. The ship had sailed for the purpose of supplying a young colony. She had therefore on board every conceivable article we could desire in our present situation. Our only difficulty, indeed, was to make a wise selection. A large quantity of powder and shot we first secured, and as Fritz considered that we could not have too many weapons, we added three excellent guns, and a whole armful of swords, daggers, and knives. We remembered that knives and forks were necessary. We therefore laid in a large stock of them, and kitchen utensils of all sorts. Exploring the captain's cabin, we discovered a service of silver plate, and a cellaret of good old wine. We then went over the stores, and supplied ourselves with potted meats, portable soups, Westphalian hams, sausages, a bag of maize and wheat, and a quantity of other seeds and vegetables. I then added a barrel of sulphur for matches, and as much cordage as I could find. All this, with nails, tools, and agricultural implements, completed our cargo, and sank our boat so low that I should have been obliged to lighten her had not the sea been calm. Night drew on, and a large fire, lighted by those on shore, showed us that all was well. We replied by hoisting four ship's lanterns, and two shots announced to us that our signal was perceived. Then, with a heartfelt prayer for the safety of our dear ones on shore, we retired to our boat, and Fritz, at all events, was soon sound asleep. For a while I could not sleep. The thought of my wife and children, alone and unprotected, save by the great dogs, disturbed my rest. The night at length passed away. At daybreak Fritz and I arose and went on deck. I brought the telescope to bear upon the shore, and with pleasure I saw the flag still waving in the morning breeze. While I kept the glass directed to the land, I saw the door of the tent open, and my wife appear, and look steadfastly toward us. I at once hoisted a white flag, and in reply the flag on shore was thrice dipped. Oh, what a weight seemed lifted from my heart as I saw the signal! Fritz, I said, I am not now in such haste to get back, and begin to feel compassion for all these poor beasts. I wish we could devise some means for getting them on shore. We might make a raft, suggested Fritz, 
and take off one or two at a time. True, I replied. It is easy enough to say, make a raft, but to do it is quite another thing. Well, said Fritz, I can think of nothing else, unless, indeed, we make them such swimming belts as you made for the children. Really, my boy, that idea is worth having. I am not joking indeed, I continued, as I saw him smile. We may get every one of the animals ashore in that way. So saying, I caught a fine sheep, and proceeded to put our plan into execution. I first fastened a broad piece of linen round its belly, and to this attached some corks and empty tins. Then, with Fritz's help, I flung the animal into the sea. It sank, but a moment afterward rose, and floated famously. "'Hurrah!' exclaimed Fritz. "'We will treat them all like that.' We then rapidly caught the other animals, and provided them, one after the other, with a similar contrivance. The cow and ass gave us more trouble than did the others, as for them we required something more buoyant than the mere cork. We at last found some empty casks, and fastened two to each animal by thongs passed under its belly. This done, the whole herd were ready to start, and we brought the ass to one of the ports to be the first to be launched. After some manoeuvring we got him in a convenient position, and then a sudden heave sent him plunging into the sea. He sank, and then, buoyed up by the casks, emerged head and back from the water. The cow, sheep, and goats followed him one after the other, and then the sow alone remained. She seemed, however, determined not to leave the ship. She kicked, struggled, and squealed so violently that I really thought we should be obliged to abandon her. At length, after much trouble, we succeeded in sending her out of the port after the others. And when once in the water, such was the old lady's energy that she quickly distanced them, and was the first to reach the shore. We had fastened to the horns or neck of each animal a cord with a float attached to the end, and now embarking we gathered up these floats, set sail, and steered for shore, drawing our herd after us. Delighted with the successful accomplishment of our task, we got out some biscuits and enjoyed a midday meal. Then, while Fritz amused himself with his monkey, I took up my glass and tried to make out how our dear ones on shore were employing themselves. As I was thus engaged, a sudden shout from Fritz surprised me. I glanced up. There stood Fritz with his gun to his shoulder, pointing it at a huge shark. The monster was making for one of the finest sheep. He turned on his side to seize his prey. As the white of his belly appeared, Fritz fired. The shot took effect and our enemy disappeared, leaving a trace of blood on the calm water. "'Well done, my boy!' I cried. "'You will become a crack shot one of these days, but I trust you will not often have such dangerous game to shoot.' Fritz's eyes sparkled at his success and my praise, and, reloading his gun carefully, watched the water. But the shark did not again appear, and, borne onward by the breeze, we quickly neared the shore. Steering the boat to a convenient landing-place, I cast off the ropes which secured the animals, and let them get ashore as best they might. There was no sign of my wife or children when we stepped on land, but a few moments afterward they appeared, and with a shout of joy ran toward us. We were thankful to be once more united, and after asking and replying to a few preliminary questions, proceeded to release our herd from their swimming-belts, which— though so useful in the water, were exceedingly inconvenient on shore. My wife was astonished at the apparatus. "'How clever you are!' said she. "'I am not the inventor,' I replied. "'The honour is due to Fritz. He not only thought of this plan for bringing off the animals, but saved one at least of them from a most fearful death. And I then told them how bravely he had encountered the shark.' My wife was delighted with her son's success, but declared that she would dread our trips to the vessel more than ever, knowing that such savage fish inhabited the waters. Fritz, Ernest, and I began the work of unloading our craft, while Jack, seeing that the poor donkey was still encumbered with his swimming-belt, tried to free him from it. 
but the donkey would not stand quiet, and the child's fingers were not strong enough to loosen the cordage. Finally, therefore, he scrambled upon the animal's back, and, urging him on with hand and foot, trotted toward us. "'Come, my boy,' I said, "'no one must be idle here, even for a moment. You will have riding practice enough hereafter. Dismount, and come and help us.' Jack was soon on his feet. "'But I have not been idle all day,' he said. "'Look here.' And he pointed to a belt round his waist. It was a broad belt of yellow hair, in which he had stuck a couple of pistols and a knife. "'And see,' he added, "'what I have made for the dogs. Here, Juno! Turk!' The dogs came bounding up at his call, and I saw that they were each supplied with a collar of the same skin, in which were fastened nails, which bristled round their necks in a most formidable manner. "'Capital! Capital, my boy!' said I. "'But where did you get your materials, and who helped you?' "'Except in cutting the skin,' said my wife, "'he had no assistance, and as for the materials, Fritz's jackal supplied us with the skin, and the needles and thread came out of my wonderful bag. You little think how many useful things may be had from that same bag. It is woman's duty and nature, you know, to see after trifles. Fritz evidently did not approve of the use to which his jackal's hide had been devoted, and, holding his nose, begged his little brother to keep at a distance. "'Really, Jack,' he said, "'you should have cured the hide before you used it. The smell is disgusting. Don't come near me.' "'It is not the hide that smells at all,' retorted Jack. "'It is your nasty jackal itself that you left in the sun.' "'Now, boys,' said I, "'no quarrelling here. Do you, Jack, help your brother to drag the carcass to the sea, and if your belt smells after that, you must take it off and dry it better.' The jackal was dragged off, and we then finished our work of unloading the boat. When this was accomplished we started for our tent, and, finding no preparation for supper, I said, "'Fritz, let us have a Westphalian ham.' "'Ernest,' said my wife, smiling, "'let us see if we cannot conjure up some eggs.' Fritz got out a splendid ham, and carried it to his mother triumphantly, while Ernest set before me a dozen white balls with parchment-like coverings. "'Turtle's eggs,' said I. "'Well done, Ernest. Where did you get them?' That, replied my wife, shall be told in due course when we relate our adventures. Now we will see what they will do toward making a supper for you. With these and your ham, I do not think we shall starve. Leaving my wife to prepare supper, we returned to the shore, and brought up what of the cargo we had left there. Then, having collected our herd of animals, we returned to the tent. The meal which awaited us was as unlike the first supper we had there enjoyed as possible. My wife had improvised a table of a board laid on two casks. On this was spread a white damask tablecloth, on which were placed knives, forks, spoons, and plates for each person. A tureen of good soup first appeared, followed by a capital omelette, then slices of the ham, and finally some Dutch cheese, butter, and biscuits— with a bottle of the captain's canary wine, completed the repast. While we thus regaled ourselves, I related to my wife our adventures, and then begged she would remember her promise, and tell me all that had happened in my absence. End of chapter 2, part 2, read by Kara Schallenberg on July 14, 2009, in San Diego, California.